Sam sat down and scratched his head and yawned like a cavern. He was worried. The afternoon was getting late and he thought this sudden sleepiness uncanny. There's more behind this than sun and warm air, he muttered to himself. I don't like this great big tree. I don't trust it. Hark at it singing about sleep now. This won't do at all. He pulled himself to his feet and staggered off to see what had become of the ponies. He found that two had wandered on a good way along the path, and he had just caught them and brought them back towards the others. When he heard two noises, one loud and the other soft but very clear. One was a splash of something heavy falling into the water. The other was a noise like the snick of a lock when a door quietly closes fast. He rushed back to the bank. Frodo was in the water close to the edge and a great tree root seemed to be over him and holding him down, but he was not struggling. Sam gripped him by the jacket and dragged him from under the root, and then with difficulty hauled him onto the bank. Almost at once he woke and coughed and spluttered. Do you know, Sam, he said at length, the beastly tree threw me in. I felt it. The big root just twisted around and tipped me in. You were dreaming, I expect, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. You shouldn't sit in such a place if you feel sleepy. But what about the others? Frodo asked. I wonder what sort of dreams they are having. They ran round to the other side of the tree and then Sam understood the click that he had heard. Pippin had vanished. The crack by which he had laid himself had closed together so that not a chink could be seen. Mary was trapped. Another crack had closed about his waist. His legs lay outside, but the rest of him was inside a dark opening, the edges of which gripped like a pair of pincers. Frodo and Sam beat first upon the tree trunk where Pippin had lain. They then struggled frantically to pull open the jaws of the crack that held poor Mary. It was quite useless. What a foul thing to happen, cried Frodo wildly. Why did we ever come to this dreadful forest? I wish we were all back at Crick Hollow. He kicked the tree with all his strength, heedless of his own feet. A hardly perceptible shiver ran through the stem and up into the branches. The leaves rustled and whispered, thus with a sound now of faint and far-off laughter. I suppose we haven't got an axe among our luggage, Mr. Frodo? asked Sam. I brought a little hatchet for chopping firewood, said Frodo. That wouldn't be much use. Wait a minute, cried Sam, struck by an idea suggested by firewood. We might do something with fire. We might, said Frodo doubtfully. We might succeed in roasting Pippin alive inside. We might try to hurt or frighten this tree to begin with, said Sam fiercely. If it don't let them go, I'll have it down, if I have to gnaw it. He ran to the ponies and before long came back with two tinder boxes and a hatchet. <laughs> Quickly they gathered dry grass and leaves and bits of bark and made a pile of broken twigs and chopped sticks. These they heaped against the trunk on the far side of the tree upon the prisoners. As soon as Sam had struck a spark into the tinder, it kindled the dry grass, and a flurry of flame and smoke went up. The twigs crackled. Little fingers of fire licked against the dry, scored rind of the ancient tree and scorched it. A tremor ran through the hole below. The leaves seemed to hiss above their heads with the sound of pain and anger. A loud scream came from Mary, and from far inside the tree they heard Pippin give a muffled yell. Put it out! Put it out! cried Mary. He'll swing me and if you don't keep that down. Who? What? shouted Frodo, rushing round to the other side of the tree. Put it out! Put it out! begged Mary. The branches of the willow began to sway violently. There was a sound as of a wind rising and spreading outwards to the branches of all the other trees at round about, as though they had dropped a stone into a quiet slumber of the river valley and set up ripples of anger that ran out over the whole forest. Sam kicked at the little fire and stamped out the sparks. But Frodo, without any clear idea of why he did so, or what he hoped for, ran along the path crying, Help! 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 It seemed to him that he could hardly hear the sound of his own shrill voice. It was blown away from him by the willow wind and drowned in the clamor of leaves as soon as the words left his mouth. He felt desperate, lost, and witless. Suddenly he stopped. There was an answer, or so he thought, but it seemed to come from behind him, away down the path further back into the forest. He turned round and listened, and soon there could be no doubt. 
Someone was singing a song. A deep, glad voice was singing carelessly and happily. But it was singing nonsense. Half hopeful and half afraid of some new danger, Frodo and Sam now both stood still. Suddenly, out of a long string of nonsense words, or so they seemed, the voice rose up loud and clear and burst into the song. Hey, a merry doll, very doll, my darling. Life goes the weather wind and the sun is charming. Down to long under hill, shining in the sunlight, waiting on the horse that wore the cold and soft as ice. There, my pretty lady, is never woman sought her. Slender as the willow one, clearer as the water. Oh, Tom Bombadil, water lily springing. Comes popping home again, can you hear him singing? Hey, come, dairy doll, dairy doll, a merry o. Goldberry, goldberry, merry yellow berry o. Poor old willow man, you tuck your roots away. Tom's in a hurry now, evening will follow day. Tom's going home again, what are lilies bringing? Hey, come, dairy doll, can't you hear me singing? Frodo and Sam stood as if enchanted. The wind puffed out, the leaves hung silently again on stiff branches. There was another burst of song, and then suddenly, hopping and dancing along the path, there appeared above the reeds an old battered hat, with a tall crown and a long blue feather stuck in the band. With another hop and a bound, there came into view a man, or so it seemed. At any rate, he was too large and heavy for a hobbit, if not quite tall enough for one of the big people, though he made noise enough for one, stomping along with great yellow boots on his thick legs and charging through grass and rushes like a cow going down to drink. He had a blue coat and a long brown beard. His eyes were blue and bright, and his face was red as a ripe apple, but creased into a hundred wrinkles of laughter. In his hands he carried a large leaf as on a tray and a small pile of white water lilies. Help! Help! cried Frodo and Sam running towards him with their hands stretched out. Whoa, whoa, steady there, cried the old man, holding up one hand, and they stopped short, as if they had been struck stiff. Mmm, now, my little fellows, where be you a-going to, puffin' like the bellows? What's the matter here, then? Do you know who I am? I'm Tom Bombadil. Tell me what's your trouble. Tom's in a hurry now. Don't you crush my lilies. And my friends are caught in the rizzo tree, cried Frodo breathlessly. Master Mary's been squeezing a crack. What? shouted Tom Bombadil, leaping up the air. Old Val Willow. Not worse than that, eh? Oh, that can soon be mended. I know the tune for him, old Grey Willow Man. I'll freeze his marrow cold if he don't behave himself. I'll sing his roots off. I'll sing a wind up and blow leaf and branch away, old Ran Willow. Setting down his lilies carefully on the grass, he ran to the tree. There he saw Mary's feet still sticking out. The rest had already been drawn further inside. Tom put his mouth to the crack and began singing into it in a low voice. They could not catch the words, but evidently Mary was aroused. His legs began to kick. Tom sprang away, and breaking off a hanging branch, he smote the side of the willow with it. You let them out again, old man willow, he said. And what for you are thinking of? You should not be waking. Eat earth, dig deep, drink water, go to sleep. Bombadil is talking. He then seized Mary's feet and drew him out of the suddenly widening crack. There was a tearing creak, the other crack split open, and out of it Pippin sprang as if he had been kicked. Then with a loud snap, those cracks closed fast again. A shudder ran through the tree, from root to tip, and complete silence fell. Thank you, thank you, said the hobbits one after another. Tom Bombadil <laughs> burst out laughing. Well, my little fellows, said he, stooping so that he peered into their faces. Hmm. You shall come home with me. The table is all laden with yellow cream, honeycomb, and white bread and butter. Goldberries waiting. Time enough for questions around the supper table. You follow after me as quick as you are able. 
With that, he picked up his lilies, and then with a beckoning wave of his hand, went hopping and dancing along the path eastward, still singing loudly and nonsensically. Too surprised and too relieved to talk, the hobbits followed after him as fast as they could, but that was not fast enough. Tom soon disappeared in front of them, and the noise of his singing got fainter and further away. Suddenly, his voice came floating back to them with a loud halloo. Hop along, my dear friends, up the withy window. Tom's going on ahead, candles for to kindle. Down west sinks the sun, soon you'll be groping. When the night shadows fall, then the door will open. Out from the window panes, light will twinkle yellow. Fear no alder black, heed no hoary willow. Fear neither root nor bough. Tom goes on before you. Hey now, merry doll, we'll be waiting for you. After that, the hobbits heard no more. Almost at once, the sun seemed to sink into the trees behind them. They thought of the slanting light of evening littering on the Brandywine River, and the windows of Bucklebury beginning to gleam with hundreds of lights. Great shadows fell across them. Trunks and branches of trees hung dark and threatening over the path. <laughs> White mists began to rise and curl on the surface of the river and stray about the roots of the trees upon its borders. Out of the very ground at their feet, a shadowy steam arose and mingled with the swiftly falling dusk. It became difficult to follow the path, and they were very tired. Their legs seemed leaden. Strange furtive noises ran among the bushes and reeds on either side of them. And if they looked up to the pale sky, they caught sight of queer, gnarled and knobby faces that loomed dark against the twilight, and leered down at them from the high bank at the edges of the wood. They began to feel that all this country was unreal, and that they were stumbling through an ominous dream that led to no awakening. Just as they felt their feet slowing down to a standstill, they noticed that the ground was gently rising. The water began to murmur. In the darkness they caught the white glimmer of foam, where the river flowed over a short fall. Then suddenly the trees came to an end, and the mists were left behind. They stepped out from the forest, and found a wide sweep of grass welling up before them. The river, now small and swift, was leaping merrily down to meet them, glinting here and there in the light of the stars, which were already shining in the sky. The grass under their feet was smooth and short, as if it had been mown or shaven. The eaves of the forest behind were clipped and trim as a hedge. The path was now plain before them, well tended and bordered with stone. It wound up onto the top of a grassy knoll, now grey under the pale starry night, and there, still high above them on a further slope, they saw the twinkling lights of a house. Down again the path went, and then up again, up a long smooth hillside of turf towards the light. Suddenly a wide yellow beam flowed out brightly from a door that was opened. There was Tom Bombadil's house before them, up, down, under hill. Behind it a steep shoulder of the land lay grey and bare, and beyond that the dark shapes of the Barrow Down stalked away into the eastern night. They all hurried forward, hobbits and ponies, already half their weariness and all their fears had fallen from them. Hey, come, merry doll, rolled out the song to greet them. Hey, come, merry doll, hope along my hearties. Hobbits, ponies all, we're all fond of parties. Now let the fun begin, let us sing together. Then another clear voice, as young and as ancient as spring, like the song of a glad water flowing down into the night from a bright morning in the hills, came falling like silver to meet them. Now let the song begin, let us sing together, sun, stars, moon, and mist, and the cloudy weather, light from the falling leaf, blue on the feather, wind on the open hill, bells on the heather, breeze by the shady pool, lilies on the water, tom, bombardel, and the river Georgia. And with that song, the hobbits stood upon the threshold, and a golden light was all about them. <laughs>